Richard Di Natale is Green Senator for Victoria. He joins us now. Good morning, Senator. Morning. The AMA is saying that public hospitals are facing a perfect storm, that the number of new beds can't keep up with the increase in population. Are they right? They're absolutely right. And at the heart of this is a measure that was announced in last year's budget, which effectively gutted funding for our hospital system. The current government decided to change the formula upon which it funds our public hospitals. The impact of that is billions of dollars taken out of the hospital system immediately and 50 billion over the next 10 years. And it will effectively decimate our public hospital system. It can but, only but be- so, Sorry to interrupt you, but, I, but I've heard the Prime Minister stand up in question time and, time and say time and time again, that funding for public hospitals is increasing every year over the next four years. Is he, is he not right? Well, he, he's right, but it's important to recognise that that funding is not going to keep up with demand. So it's no point increasing funding slightly when demand grows beyond what that increase entails. So the problem is that with population growth, with advances in healthcare technology, um, what we're seeing is we're seeing increased demand for hospital utilisation. Um, that's something that uh, I think in, in terms of being able to provide decent healthcare for people, that's a good thing. The fact that people are able to access first class hospitals in Australia is something we should be proud of. The question is, are we going to be able to, does this government intend to fund access to those services? And the problem is they've changed the formula upon which they fund our hospitals. The impact of that is a lot less money going to the hospitals than the hospitals need to perform services. The real impact on ordinary people, huge increase in waiting times for elective surgery, longer times to wait in emergency departments. It's just a measure that makes no sense. It makes no sense. The, perhaps the most disappointing thing about what the government has done is that they have changed the formula. And the formula effectively means that what we're going to see is we're going to see a, a reversion to the bad old days. In uh, the previous government, we saw something called activity-based funding. If you did 100 hip replacements, you got paid for 100 hip replacements. Under this new model, it's block funding. Uh, the governments can use uh, funding of hospitals as, again, an election tool. Um, they can do some pork barrelling when they want it. And patients suffer. That's the worst thing about these changes. So is the impact felt now? Or is it something that's just going to increase and get worse and worse over coming Well, it's felt, it is felt immediately. There are hundreds of millions of dollars that have been taken out already uh, from last year's budget. Uh, there are hundreds of millions of dollars more that will, if this formula doesn't change, will be taken out of this year's budget. And over the next 10 years, $50 billion taken out of our public hospitals. It can only mean one thing, that if you need to have your knee replaced, if you uh, need to have uh, any other form of elective surgery, if you present to an emer emergency department, you're going to be waiting longer. And given that waiting times are already excessive, why would we be making a bad problem worse? Well, I guess one of the problems that the government is facing is the problem with the budget and the budget bottom line, that it wants to restore the budget to something approaching surplus. And of course, there's all sorts of demands on money. There is an argument underway at the moment whether the government has a spending problem or a revenue problem. What's your feeling? Well, let me tell you, in healthcare, it's actually got both. <laughs> It's got both in terms of the fact that it's not prepared to do the difficult health reform that would actually enable us to be more efficient in spending the resources we've already got. And I've met with the health minister and uh, written to her and uh, said to her that I think there are some areas where we can make savings in healthcare that would be good for patients and good for the bottom line. But, Such as? Um, oh, well, for example, we spend a lot of money doing performing some investigations that provide very little value. Um, we haven't had a good look at the Medicare benefit schedule to look at whether we're getting value for money for what we pay for some procedures. There are a lot of areas. There's the procurement of medicines. There are a number of areas where we could make savings, where we could be spending existing resources better. But in terms of revenue overall, of course, of course there's an opportunity to look at, at the revenue side of the equation, which this government stubbornly refuses to do. There's the issue of corporate tax evasion. There's the issue of superannuation tax concessions that go to wealthy people. 
Uh, there's the issue of huge subsidies that go to the mining industry. Um, there are uh, huge opportunities to look at the revenue side of the equation, um, as well as to make sure we're efficient in what we spend at the moment. And if we did that, we could afford to pay for world-class health care. In the end, it's a choice. People want uh, governments to fund health care. They're prepared to pay for it. And it's just a question about whether this government's going to put its ideological blinkers on and say, no, we don't want government to do this. We think this is an individual responsibility and we want to use a pays model. Or whether it's going to acknowledge where community sentiment is at, which is we know that collectively we can fund a terrific health system and we want our governments to do it. If we accept that health care is growing more expensive, partly because of ageing population, but also those other things you mentioned, such as uh, newer and more expensive technology, do we need to find that money to pay for that from elsewhere? Or is there an argument that we should actually, if you like, increase the size of government expenditure overall? Uh, well, I think, again, you, you can do both. The first thing I'll say is um, the fact that healthcare spending is increasing is in, not in and of itself a bad thing. If, it, projections look like over the next 10 years we might spend another percent of GDP. If that buys us better health care, if it means that we live longer, if it means that we can get diagnosed uh, with potentially fatal conditions earlier, if it means treatment's better, then surely that's a good thing. And that's what the whole purpose of economic growth is to pay for these things that we all want, that we recognise, uh, uh, using an economic term, are superior goods and that as individuals we want to pay for. So then the question is, how do we do it? And as I said, I think there are areas within the health budget that we can gain efficiencies. But we do need to look at increasing um, spending as a proportion of GDP or, or our revenue as a proportion of, of GDP. And if you look at where taxation spend now is compared to where it was um, under the Costello era, for example, we're actually quite a low taxing, um, in a low taxing environment at the moment. And you look at us compared to other OECD countries, our proportion of uh, um, taxes uh, as a proportion of GDP is low. Um, I, I think if you asked Australians, would you be, do you think that we should go after corporations who um, avoid paying tax by having offshore accounts? Uh, do you think we should go after um, wealthy superannuation tax concessions? Do you think we should go after those huge handouts that go to the mining industry so that we can pay for better health care? I'm sure that Australians would say, let's do those things. Let's close those loopholes. So just to be clear here, you're saying that it would be acceptable to increase uh, tax revenue as a percentage of GDP. Would it be acceptable, if necessary, to increase uh, the percentage of spending, in other words, the size of government as a percentage of GDP, larger government? Well, uh, again, it's not a question of, you know, whether you ideologically favour large government or small government. It's a question of, of, of whether you favour good government. And you, you need to ask yourself, what is the role of government here? And in the area of healthcare, I absolutely think that um, we know, the evidence is clear, that collectively funded healthcare services are delivered more efficiently. If you look at those systems like the UK and New Zealand, where there's a big role for government in healthcare, compared to the US, you get much better health care. So when it comes to health, of course, of course there's a role for increased government involvement, increased government spending, because the only other alternative is you do it privately uh, through a range of competing insurers, which is much less efficient and much less fair. So I think you've got to, it's horses for courses. In the area of health care and education, for example, there has to be a role for a government and for increased government spending. OK, just finally on another topic, Fairfax is reporting that uh, oil and gas companies have been allowed into exploring the marine reserves uh, system. What concerns you about this report? Well, the whole point of having a marine reserve is that it's protected from those sort of exploitative industries, that you protect it from destructive industries, that you create an environment where you allow um, those ecosystems to recover. Um, the advantage of doing that is that it also works as a nursery for uh, people, for example, who want to enjoy um, recreational fishing outside of those marine reserves. The whole point of having those areas is so that we can allow people to enjoy those resources, whether it's recreational fishing, whether it's 
um, activities like tourism um, that, that involve uh, snorkeling and scuba diving and so on. And of course, just in terms of protecting biodiversity itself for the fact that um, we have some of the most marine rich biodiversity anywhere in the world. Now, um, the idea of allowing an exploitative industry, the gas and oil industries, for example, into a, a marine protected system just makes no sense. What's the point of having marine reserves if you're going to allow those activities to take place? Now, this marine reserve system was largely set up by Labor when it was in government most recently. The present government is reviewing that system, as I understand it. Does this suggest to you that perhaps they've already made their mind up? Oh, of course it does. I mean, look, you know, you need to just look at this government's track record when it comes to the environment. They are, they have no regard at all for our natural environment, whether it be allowing coal seam gas to go on in some of the most, uh, you know, important uh, natural environment farmland um, anywhere in the world, whether it be the exploitation of our, you know, precious um, marine environment and you need to look at the Great Barrier Reef which is currently under threat and we're looking at having our um, the international community make an emphatic statement on that. Look this government's got a horrible track record when it comes to environmental protection uh, and this is just another symptom of that. They need to accept that we've got a marine reserve system in place for a whole range of reasons uh, and um, to allow an industry uh, to go in and undertake activities that were never, would never be allowed uh, in any other marine reserve system anywhere in the world it just makes no sense and it speaks volumes about their view on the environment. Okay, Senator Richard Dean Natale, thanks for your time today. Yeah, pleasure.